now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It is Friday, and I am in love. I'm Andrew Langer. This is O'Connor and Company on uh, WMAL uh, News. I'm sorry. Let's, 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 be, let's be standard about this. It is 707 on News Talk uh, 105.9 WMAL. We are making sense of the news. Good Friday to one and all. We've got great things coming up on the show today. Uh, uh, Bram Weinstein, who is the play-by-play announcer for the Commanders, i got to talk to him about what's going to go on with the Commanders this weekend. we got Neil Parrott in the next hour joining us. Uh, he's running for Congress in Maryland's 6th Congressional District. This, of course, is O'Connor and Company. I am Andrew Langer in for Larry O'Connor alongside Patrice Onwuka. Happy Friday, Patrice. Happy Friday, Andrew. We made it. I- I, I yes yes we hit more more or less I'm still I'm still not convinced that I've made it to Friday yet. It, it, b- besides the fact that it's you know it was a four day week, but somehow mm. this four day week felt like a six day week. I don't know. But listen, it joining does. us right now because we've got to talk about we spent a lot of time in the last hour talking about Hunter Biden mm-hmm. and this plea deal that was reached, a sudden plea deal that was reached. Uh, joining us right now is Tristan Levitt. He is uh, president of Empower Oversight. He represents uh, Gary Shapley, who's the IRS whistleblower and Tristan I mean you know you guys released a statement yesterday were you surprised that uh that uh, uh, uh he entered a plea first of all were you surprised he entered a plea were you surprised he tried to do an Alfred plea <laughs> well I think everyone was surprised by the Alfred plea yeah. including the prosecutor so that definitely was you know something that was pretty audacious on his part to try that without even talking to them beforehand and even when you've talked to prosecutors it, it, it's something's not frequently granted it requires high approvals within doj but uh overall i wasn't surprised that there was a plea you know as the irs whistleblowers gary shapley and joe ziegler disclosed to congress last summer which the ways and means committee in the house then released there were massive amounts of evidence of these crimes and uh it had been gathered over a long period of time by the irs prosecutors had a very strong case so i had been predicting for weeks for months even that this trial would not go forward. No one uh, in the Biden family wanted to see all of this evidence drug out again. And uh, mm-hmm. the only question yeah. to me was whether or not there would be, you know, a, a plea deal that was offered by prosecutors yeah. like there was mm-hmm. last year. So I was happy to see that they didn't. Well, what's interesting, strong. Tristan, from your statement here, um, <clears throat> you said that the same day this plea agreement, uh, well, that Hunter Biden pled guilty, the IRS retaliated against your client, Gary Shapley, by removing him and his entire team from the case in reprisal for whistleblowing. Um, it, 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 it's shocking to me to hear that um, whistleblowers in the Biden administration are are facing this kind of reprisal, uh, what, what's going on here and where is this coming from? Is it coming from the very top? Well, first, Patrice, let me tell you that we have lots and lots of clients who are experiencing reprisal yeah. right now in the mm. Biden administration from the FBI or from the Secret Service, from the IRS. But, mm. um, you know, this is something that uh, I, I wouldn't I don't think there is any evidence that it's coming from the top necessarily, but it's something that, you know, there's kind of a twofold issue. One, just within the IRS, Gary and Joe have continued to suffer consequences. Going back wow. to last year, yeah. as the statement talks about when they were removed from the case, that is something that was driven by David Weiss himself. And so, you know, we have from the outset said that in addition to offering the sweetheart plea deal, you know, before the sweetheart deal that everyone saw with the two misdemeanors is the deal that is referenced in our statement where prosecutors in Delaware were going to give Hunter Biden a deal where he had to offer no guilty plea at all. It was just a deferred uh, prosecution agreement. And so that was the exact same day these guys were retaliated against by t- being taken off. So David Weiss needs to answer for that, certainly. Hmm. So, Tristan, do, do us a favor. Just so let's dial it back a second because I'm I'm fascinated by this this project. Uh, I'm, I'm calling it a project. It may, may not be the right term. Empower oversight. Talk to us about what that is, the work that you're doing, and and, and the importance of whistleblowers overall. Absolutely. So, my partner Jason Foster started Empower three years ago. He and I worked together for Senator Grassley. 13 years ago, my first investigation out of law school working for Senator Grassley was into ATF's Operation Fast and Furious. Jason and I led that for Senator Grassley. And so over the years, he and I have both worked with hundreds of whistleblowers. And so when he started this, I was leading a whistleblower protection 
agency um, during the Trump and then the beginning of the Biden administration. It's an independent agency. And so Empower is a nonprofit organization. All we do is work with whistleblowers to help make sure that their disclosures that are significant get to Congress and then that they are protected, you know, not just Congress, but inspectors general. And so we're representing the air marshals who came forward about the Tulsi Gabbard quiet skies monitoring representing mm. FBI whistleblowers who have testified alongside in front of the weaponization committee. They're just good people throughout government that see problems and want to speak up about them, but there's so much risk in doing that. So we want to make mm. sure that people are know the legal protections and know the right way to come forward to ensure that they you know, are best protected. Tristan, you know something, do me a favor because we're, we're going on this, and I know I'm going to pivot here. Obviously, the Hunter Biden story is the big thing in the news, but I don't want people to forget about this situation with Tulsi Gabbard. This is... I know I've been using the word insane a lot today, but this is a crazy story uh, uh, that your clients have have, uh, thankfully spoken out about. Tell us about what what, what the allegations are here with with regards to uh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard. So at the end of July, Tulsi Gabbard was on Laura Ingram and spoke out against Kamala Harris as the Democrat nominee. And the very next day, she was added to a program called Quiet Skies within TSA, The way that TSA operates, if someone is on the terrorist screening database, they get what's called special mission coverage, where they have extended screening through all of the airport. They might have canine sniffing, uh, uh, drug sniffing, bomb sniffing, canine teams, um, and then they'll have multiple marshals with them, three on the flight just watching that person. Well, Quiet Skies is a program that in the last few years has come out where even if you are not on the terror screening database, for whatever reason, you trigger these rules, and they will find all of that same coverage. So Tulsi Gabbard was added to that program. Air Marshal saw that and immediately thought, this can't be right. You know, not only is she a former member of Congress, a former presidential candidate, she's a lieutenant uh, colonel in the uh, Army Reserves. And so this was something that they immediately flagged. They disclosed to the media and to others. We've disclosed it to Congress and the Inspector General, but she's had at least eight flights where she's been subjected, again, not only to all of the extra screening, to, and then when she gets to the gate, to screening again, um, and pat down to the most invasive things you can imagine, but then mm. marshals, air marshals just on the flight, specifically there just to take notes on what she's doing and to watch her. And so it appears... You know, TSA has yet to answer for, you know, why she was added to this program, because the clear yeah. the clear thing they need to rebut is that it looks like political retaliation. Absolutely. Without a you doubt. know, um, quickly, there's a new potentially a new administration. Um, do you feel like the protections for whistleblowers are strong enough? Does Congress need to do more or is it just that they're, whatever the um, whatever the, the protections already in place are need to be fairly meted out? They definitely need to be fairly meted out. The biggest weakness right now is the FBI whistleblowers don't have the same protections as others. And so we have been advocating for a long time that FBI whistleblowers need to have the same process available. Additionally, security clearances have been used against a lot of folks. And so Congress ought to pass a law that will help ensure that those aren't able to be used as a means of retaliation. Those are the two biggest needs right now. Great. Well, Tristan, listen, we have to leave it there. We really appreciate you coming on with us today. How do folks find out more about the works you guys are doing at Empower Oversight? It's just Empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, Oversight.org. EmpowerOversight.org is the website. Thank you so very much. Listen, we will continue in just a moment. But first, it's 7.15 a.m. WMAL. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live from the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. So, Patrice, you've got uh, uh, school-age kids. Uh, yes. My kids are now, you know, well, they're ones in college, ones out of college. Okay. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, you get back to school and you got to get back into the groove of things. There we go. Little, there little Jackson go. 5 there. Um, you know, getting into that homework groove is tough. And now there's a new study out there that's saying that, that that we may be giving our kids too much homework. I know I know certainly we're not giving our kids enough time to breathe these days. We've got, you know, I literally we're, our kids are so scheduled uh that they don't have time to be just kids. Uh but now from this is uh, from the uh, from Ed Source uh-huh. um and Stanford Research a 2020 study uh 67% of of 50,000 high schoolers surveyed said homework was a major source of stress. 
For students with at least ho- three hours worth of nightly homework, that percentage was 80%. I get it. Listen, I, I can poo-poo it and say, oh, you know, oh, homework, too much homework. Oh, how dare they? But on the other hand, that's a lot to put on a kid. Um, uh, your, your thoughts here with your kids on, on, on homework and so too much I- homework. Is there such a thing? I don't believe that there is too much homework. I am old school maybe in that way. I have a seventh grader. I have a kindergartner and a pre-Ker. I am not expecting homework for the pre-Ker, although they do. we do get those take-home cut and paste, you know, little assignments. The kindergartner, I'm sure we'll be getting into them soon. And we just went to back to school night last night. The, the, sixth, the seventh grader, I was shocked last year when the math teacher said, no, we don't, I don't do homework. My class is the easiest A. I was... I was actually upset because I don't want my son in an easy A class. I actually want him to be challenged. And I think homework is important in some subjects more than others in really reinforcing um, what you learned in the classroom. I mean, if you have struggled with algebra, doing some algebra problems at home every night for four days, hey, Friday, no homework. Yes, that should be a standard. But I think it's it's important to kind of remind kids of what they're learning. to expand their mind. Now, that said, please do not put homework assignments where you are indoctrinating the kids with your liberal philosophy on exploiting illegal migrant workers. Right. Uh, and I'm not making this up. I wish I was. That kind of homework I would, li- I would like to see less of. Um, but I'm, I'm not opposed to two, two, three hours of homework. It just, it, it's important, I think. Well, I mean, listen, I think we get down to the issue of the fundamentals, right? Which is, you know, you got to reinforce uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic and make sure the mm-hmm. kids are doing this doing this basic foundational work, right? Of writing reports and doing research. I mean, doing yes. the things that teach you how to think, not what to think. That's, yes. a, that's a good thing. But at some point in time, what you don't want to do is get kids so inundated and so overwhelmed that they feel mm. that they can't. They just can't, as someone just pointed out to me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the idea of getting kids to hate school and hate learning, you, you, you don't want that there. There's got to be a happy medium here is what yeah. is what I'm saying. I mean, yes, I, I'm not for a no homework. Right. I, am I willing to give on a couple of hours worth? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, do you do you need it? Maybe you don't need to read 10 chapters in, um, you know, the Iliad or whatever. But but that said, I, I worry about I, frankly, I worry about educators who tell me, oh, I never give homework assignments because what a kid learns in the classroom, it's maybe it sticks with them. But I think that it sticks a little better when they're asked when they come home a little bit later. Oh, yeah. Just to refresh and go back through what they learned earlier in the day. Where, where I, are I, I you on? Uh, do you let your do you let your kids watch uh, TV on school afternoon school nights? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a normal mom. Like I, grew, <laughs> I was a latchkey kid. So I okay. was doing homework with the, with every TV show you can imagine going on, not inappropriate stuff, but I watched a lot of TV sure. while I did my homework and I was a straight A student and I, and I did really well. See, so I then, mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. Just, just the opposite here. I was, I was certainly not a straight <laughs> A student and my parents were very, very anti TV at night. So, you know, uh. and that's just it. I'm not, of course now I'm a TV junkie. Listen, we're going to continue to have this uh, discussion. So am I too. But. Um, uh, we're going to continue to have this discussion because we got to get into some of the woke homework assignments that are out there. Mm, It's uh, 721 here on WMAL. So as we're talking about homework here, uh, Libby Emmons from the Post Millennial, uh, she is, uh, um, you know, this is the amazing thing about parenting in the modern era. Patrice, I'm sure you see this, right? Is that is that if you're a, 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 a social media person, Mm-hmm. And you're a parent. You can put this stuff up on your uh, on your social media pages. Uh, Libby Emmons from the Post Millennial. She's talking about uh, uh, in a West Virginia school the woke assignment uh, that her son was given. Let's play cut twenty one. Let's all discuss our pronouns. And you you know. can't joke about it. Like fastest, imagine being right? a kid. Fastest way to make it uncool. That. Crazy, fastest right? way to make it uncool. Kids don't think that what their teachers want to do is mm. cool. No. You know, like my son <laughs> like, came home with some stupid assignment to... about uh, how you have to. The assignment was to do a biography of a scientist that was not white or male. What? And he oh, was, really? like, and he was yeah. like, white male. That's who we're doing. And I was like, what the hell is this? Crazy. And he was like, I don't know, mom. This is so stupid. Wait, wait, I was in like, New York or West Virginia? West Virginia, Tim. Mm. Right, because because teachers are now indoctrinators Everywhere. as opposed to as opposed to as opposed to just teachers right this is there's an agenda here mm-hmm. and that's that is just again it we we've gone we've become detached from any sort of objective reality i mean are you seeing this with any of your kids and uh oh. and homework 
Yes, absolutely. And I obviously it's in the social sciences, um, the social studies, uh, where we're learning about not just history and geography, but um, the lived experiences of different peoples. So I'm I'm going to be uh, watching my seventh graders' homework, particularly with a with a with an eye, because sure. you know I, I don't want to see this type of stuff. It, it was so interesting. Excuse me, last school year where he had an assignment reading about. Um, migrant workers uh, and from coming from Mexico, illegal, undocumented, by the way, and their mistreatment in large food processing plants. And it's like, well, what, 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 what is the impact of capitalism or the, I was, I was so Oh, <laughs> sure. That. Yeah. So I made sure that his answers were written in a way that would not support the narrative that they were pushing forward. Um, I do fault myself for not going to the, the teacher and saying, hey, what is this? Why are you right. pushing this? And I think I'm going to hold my own self accountable. Yeah, I, I've told the story about dealing with my own teacher who didn't like me using the word tribe uh, to talk about <laughs> what was going on in, in uh, with tribes in Africa. Uh, yeah. More in a moment. It's 729. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. We are back, everybody. I am Andrew Langer. No, I was waiting. I was playing it to the label there, Michael. Thank you. I knew what I was doing here. Uh, anyway, uh, it is uh, it is uh, 737 here on uh, WMAL O'Connor and Company News Talk 105.9. We are making sense of the news. Good Friday morning to one and all. Um, I'm Andrew Langer in for Larry O'Connor today, uh, sitting alongside Patrice Onwuka. Good morning, Patrice. Happy Friday to you. Happy Friday to you, Andrew, Thank and you. everybody and be, out there. Listen, um, um, we're going to be joined in the next hour by Neil Parrott. But right now, uh, because the Commanders are playing this weekend up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we've got Bram Weinstein. He's the play-by-play announcer for the Commanders and a host on 630 ESPN. So down at Raymond James Stadium, Sunday afternoon game. How are things looking for the Commanders, my friend? So that's a hard question to answer, to be honest, because everything's new. Um, 30 plus new players, new coach, new GM, very exciting new quarterback. Um, I don't know what we're going to see. So I'm pretty certain Tampa Bay doesn't know what they're going to see either. So I think there's, there's an element of disguise and surprise that's coming this weekend for sure. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, it's it. it you know, I think surprise uh, may very well rule in their favor. You think about this: an untried, untested team going out on the field. I mean, not untested. I mean, obviously they've they've had their things, but their <laughs> first sort of major game here. Um, but on the other hand, it makes it very difficult for the Buccaneers to mount uh, uh, or to to sort of determine what kind of a, a, a strategy to use against them. Um, what are we uh, What are we looking at in terms of uh, of uh, Peters as the as the GM and Dan Quinn as the uh, as the new head coach? So I think, like, really in this year, and and I think because of how well the summer went, and that really is based around the quarterback Jaden Daniels, who's looked terrific. And yeah. I don't want to get too far ahead or put too much pressure on him, but he doesn't look like a rookie. Um, Of course, he was the number two overall pick, and he won the Heisman Trophy, and he played a lot of college football. He's very experienced. So this shouldn't be that much of a surprise. I mean, they picked him to be a franchise quarterback, but he is a rookie. He hasn't looked like one. So, like, when this process really started and they really flipped over the roster, and it's a very, very different team than the one that we had a year ago, um, they they described this as a recalibration and not a rebuild. And as the summer kind of progressed – um, if you listen to them a week ago, you know, they, they recognize that this is year one for them. They recognize this is a team that hasn't won very much recently. They recognize it's a very new team, and it's baked in that there's going to be ups and downs. But if you listen closely to what they were saying, you know, they'll, they'll say we're eyeing winning in the future, but we want to win now. And you can feel this confidence that they think they're better than what everybody outside of this area thinks. And so we'll see on Sunday. I mean, Tampa Bay was in the playoffs a year ago. Tampa Bay's won their division three years in a row. Tampa Bay's probably an unknown, very good team. So this is a really, really good test for Washington to start the season with. 
Well, was there anything in the preseason that you that gives you hope um, for the Commanders? I mean, I know they won one what one preseason game against the Patriots, my my hometown team, <laughs> but the Patriots are not the of today are not the Patriots of right. um, of the Tom Brady era. So, but it was there. Is there anything out of the preseason that gives you hope, though, for you know a strong at least start to this season? Yes. So they did more so than the games. They did two joint practices, which have become really more important than the games because the games, a lot of the teams have their own priorities and they only play portions of their team at any given time. They don't really game plan for one another. It's very hard to tell by results, like what any of that means. But in the practices, you see the starters go against the starters and specifically the one in Miami. Miami's also a very good team. They were the they were the most prolific offense in the league a year ago. Uh, they're probably favorites to at least get back to the playoffs, if not go farther this year. And they went toe to toe with them and shined. And specifically, Daniels, Jaden Daniels, shined in this practice. Mm. Their defense held up against one of the best execution you know teams in the league. So I remember that as a real high point. So much so that Daniels didn't even play in the last preseason game. So here's a guy who hasn't played in the NFL before, and they're arresting him saying he's good, that he's going to be fine. And I'll just go back to what I said earlier. At every step of the way, he's never looked like a rookie. And in this league, if you have a really good quarterback, and last night the season started and both of those teams have really, really good quarterbacks, Pat Mahomes and Lamar Jackson, there's there's a reason why they're in the playoffs every single year. So, again, I I don't want to get too ahead of everything because he hasn't played yet, but he looks, feels, sounds great, and he has the confidence in every way by action and in what they're saying about him. And if this is what it's going to be, that we're going to have a top-tier quarterback sooner rather than later, then, you know, I'll go back to what you asked originally. What do we expect to see? I don't know. Like, call me in December and let's see what our sure. record is. <laughs> of course. Well, listen, uh, and, and of course, we're, we're talking with, uh, with Bram Weinstein. Um, real quick, before we let you go, we're talking about Jaden Daniels. How is this new team gelling together? I mean, again, to gin off of what Patrice said uh, regarding the preseason, the team seems to be functioning as a team, something that the commanders have had a problem with in the past. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. good. Well, uh, the, the, last year yeah. went sideways. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. y- yes, so, yes, it did. It went well, sideways. Listen, so we will, we, this sorry, year feels very different. Good. Well, that's good. These feelings are very, very important feelings. Well, Bram, <laughs> yeah. Bram, thank you. Thank you so very much for, for joining us today. Uh, 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 Bram Thanks, Weinstein, Bram. Uh, play-by-play announcer for the Washington Commanders, uh, host on uh, ESPN 630. Uh, have a great time and uh, have a great time down in uh, down in Tampa. Or, yeah, down in Tampa. All right, guys. Take thanks. Care. Enjoy the season. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Listen, thanks. we've got more coming up at 743 on WMA. Technicians you can trust to use your vehicle's manufacturer recommendations for oil changes, brakes, wipers, lights, and more, saving you time and money. No appointment needed. Visit JiffyLubeDC.com. On the next Vince Colony Show, the biggest threat to the left, the truth. It tells you a lot. Join us 3 to 6 right here on WMAL. Well, big, big news yesterday in Virginia. Very excited about this news. Uh, Obviously, you know, in Virginia, we got this interesting thing where a governor cannot run for successive terms. It's one term, one and done. And that means that things move around. Uh, uh, Obviously, we got another election coming up next year with these off-year elections in Virginia. And Mm -hmm. yesterday, Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears announced that she is going to run for governor. Uh, She actually was on Fox and Friends this morning. Uh, Let's hear what she had to say. Look, we've got to win. We really have to win because the other side is wanting to do all kinds of machinations and so many gotcha stuff that's not going to help propel Virginia forward. We've got to continue what the governor has started. Governor Yunkin has laid a great foundation. We've got to keep building on that. We have had corporate headquarters that have moved here, even from overseas. We have grown businesses here. We have been an incubator for business. It's all about business because that's where the money comes from so that we can have the beautiful things we like, the quality of life, the the schools, the roads, the bridges, all of that. What I've always loved about Winsome Sears is that she gets it. She's able to articulate it. She's got an incredibly compelling life story. Oh, yes. Want to see her do more, more, more. So this is just this is just great. But yeah, Patrice, let me your 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 reaction Mm. here. 
I, I love it. Um, I'm glad that she's out of the gate, that she's um, that she's going for it. Uh, apparently that this could be a, an interesting matchup, not just because she would be on the ticket, but uh, but she could be going up against Representative Abigail Spamberger, who mm. launched her campaign uh, for the Democratic side. So if the two of them uh, gain their nominate their nominations uh, successive, uh, their their rep- their their nominations, then you could have two potential two women potentially vying for the gubernatorial seat. And I, from what I understand, um, this would make the first uh, first time a female governor would uh, would be you know over the Commonwealth of Virginia. That said, you know putting the his, the, the, the identity the, politics, the yeah. identity politics aside, I mean, I think that these two women, if it's the two of them, they couldn't be contrasted any any greater. You're right. talking about Winsome Sears, who is an who is has served in the military, who has um, a record of standing up for parents, not just parents' rights, but parental freedom um, when it comes to giving their kids an opportunity to go to whatever school you know they want to that that suits their uh, their aptitude and and um, and and really pushing forward an agenda that's a a pro business agenda. Um, I, I think obviously Winsome Sears is no fan of President Trump, and it'll be interesting to see if she copies or utilizes, I should say, the playbook of Governor Youngkin, who you know didn't you know fully pull President Trump into his race, but has recently been full throttled in his support for President Trump. So I think I think it's interesting. I'm looking forward though to the fight, and and hey, Winsome Sears. After after Governor Youngkin, back to back hits in my eyes. Right, and you know it's one of those things where, um, where, I'm sorry, now I lost my train of thought. For a second. No, no, I got it here. So you know it's one of those situations in which we've seen state Republican parties uh, and the elected officials in those parties not really gel well together as a team. In the same way, right? We were just talking with uh, Bram Weinstein about the gelling of the Washington commanders. Mm. Yes. You know, I, and I don't claim to have any special insight into what's going on down in Richmond, um, mm-hmm. but it seems to me, looking at it from the outside, that we have a fully functioning government where everybody is sort of pulling, everybody is, not sort of, everybody is pulling in the same direction and they're not trying to undercut each other, mm. which is so vitally important in terms of yes. success. So yeah. I think with, if, if, if uh, and I have no reason to think otherwise, uh, Winsome Sears having Glenn Youngkin's backing, mm-hmm. uh, she really presents a formidable challenge to Abigail Absolutely. Spanberger yeah. in, a, in a state in which the, the Virginia Democratic Party doesn't know what it is in the same way that the Democratic Party nationally mm. can't figure out what it is. Uh, this is this is important stuff here. So this would this would this would be great. So your final yeah, thoughts no, here no. on Winsome Sears. Uh, go win some go. I mean, yeah. I, I think that that's that's all you can say. And I love taking if it's two women up against each other, you're taking a lot of the identity politics off the table and, and you can actually just drill down again on their issues. Yeah, without a doubt. I, you know, and that's and that's just it sort of focusing, as you point out, the contrast. Mm-hmm. Elections are always about contrast. I mean, even yes. when there are multiple candidates running, it's usually the binary choice between choice A and choice B. Uh, in fact, one of the things that that caused uh, John McCain's 2008 run to fail, not that I want to dwell on that or the list of McCain interns who are now endorsing Kamala Harris. <laughs> um, but but, you know, the point is that McCain did not was not able to get a full contrast even you know Mitt Romney and Barack Obama mm. I mean there was somewhat of a contrast but a- again trying to run as the democrat light here mm-hmm. we have someone who is a committed constitutional conservative again with yes. a compelling life story running yes. against someone who is essentially an establishmentarian democrat who's really got to figure out you know which wing of the party she is trying to represent mm. um it's going to be some some major contrast i look forward to this race a uh, 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 great deal is you know someone who's been living in virginia for for a long time now um mm-hmm. so yeah this is this is going to be really good stuff listen it is uh, uh 753 here on o'connor and company wm 